Hello, my name is Victoria Cry, and this semester I was interning at Georgia Tech's Music Technology Department under Dr. Frank Clark. Here I would take a series of classes, seminars, as well as participate in Dr. Jason Freeman's lab where I program music in Python through a program that they created called EarSketch. Now due to my internship being a very creative internship and I'm not at a lab setting, I was able to pick a more creative topic. So I decided to do 3D printing of flute where my contribution was doing more research in the area of music technology. So my thesis was how can a design for a new simple flute with an octave range that incorporates a key mechanism be created? So this is my foundational concept map, and here's my applied concept map. I'll be going through it throughout the presentation. So some quick terminology that you need to know when I'm going through this presentation is what an embouchure hole is, the head joint, the tone holes, and the lip plate. So some foundational sub-problems. The first thing I was looking at was a material impact. This is important for me because instead of print doing a metal flute, I'm printing a plastic flute. So this could affect pitches, but what I found with my research is that since a flute works because it's a vibrating air column, that it actually the material shouldn't impact it. And as far as tone quality goes, there hasn't been evidence supporting that different materials will make it sound better. There was a huge controversy in the 1950s when people thought that gold flutes actually sounded better than silver flutes, but there is no data actually supporting this. The only thing I found about this was in Bernade's book, he said that using metals and plastics, because they're more sharp in nature, will actually possibly create turbulence, and this will be a disruption in the airstream, which will not provide a consistent tone. And so when doing these instruments with metal and plastic, edges should be rounded out for safety reasons to make sure that you don't have turbulence. So that's something I could improve on my models going forward. Then for tone hole placement, it's impacted by how far it is from the embouchure hole. So the closer it is, the higher in pitch it will be. The farther away it is, the lower in pitch. But some other factors that are affecting it are also the tone hole diameter, as well as the inner radius, the thickness of the wall of the flute, because once you have the sound wave and it ends at a certain tone hole, it has to then travel through that thickness of wall. Then you also have the surface area of the embouchure hole and then the pitch angle of the player that's playing it. Then the flute keypads. So this was important because I was looking at it with whether or not I could 3D print it. However, one of my limitations was that I was only going to use ABS plastic for printing. So 3D printing a flute keypad was not reasonable. Thus, I decided that using 1 64th of an inch of rubber gasket would be the alternative to this. So that was not 3D printed. Then I had some other things I wanted to look at to see if I could 3D print them. One of them was springs. There has been successfully printed springs. However, it was not ABS plastic, and that's a limitation of mine. So I could not successfully 3D print a spring, so that's something else that had to be purchased. And screws could be successfully 3D printed, but I decided not to because it would be easily unthreaded, and I also want it to be more durable. So now I'm going to go into the flute mechanics. So we actually had this flute in the band program that was completely wrecked after a marching band season because numerous people stepped on it. I decided to take it home, and I disassembled it to try to fix it. And so here I'm showing that, if you saw on the last slide, the head joint, um, the lip plate was actually duct taped onto the head joint because it had been significantly damaged. So I used JB Well to actually attach it back to the head joint. And then what you don't see is that in order to fix numerous leaks on the flute, which are simply air leaving the flute when you don't want it to, I actually had to use adjustment screws and different techniques to fix that. And so overall, I was able to repair the flute and save the band program $200, as well as learning the actual mechanics of the flute. So two foundational sub-problems that really stuck out to me was the significance of the cork in the flute, which I found to be that it was just originally used to make it airtight back in the 1850s when the flute was originally last revolutionized. And nowadays that is um, not important to have because we can use techniques such as soldering and metal, and with 3D printing you can just simply print the end to it. So the cork is something that I decided not to include in my flute because I already had it to be airtight, and the cork actually can cause it to be um, flat or sharp based on air temperature, so my flute will be more in tune without the cork. And as far as lip shaping, the lip, shape of the, um, the lip plate shaping hasn't been changed since the 1850s, and no one's looked into a design that would actually match the physicality of the underneath of a flute player's lip, so I go through that in my applied sub-problem. So now here I'm at my applied sub-problems. For the key mechanism, I wanted to see if there was a more effective and easier way to make keys move without springs. Now I decided to look at magnets, where I set the magnets up so that they would be repelling, and you have that it actually works on this mechanism. It simply pops back up with the magnets. And so I found out that magnets were easier to implement because when you have springs, you actually have to have a rod that's raised and that's more things to print and more ways that it could be easily broken. 
And then there was just less moving parts with the magnets in general, so I decided to implement that into my flute instead. So the space between connection joints. This became a sub problem after I printed my first iteration because I had to sand down the connection joints so much that it was unreasonable and I wanted to see if I could shave off that time by shaving off some space in between the connection joints. And so I looked at putting space um, 1 164 of an inch, 1 32nd of an inch, and 3 64 of an inch between connection joints. However, after doing the sub problem, I found that 1 64 of an inch was the smallest one of those dimensions that fit. But with my research, the reason I chose those dimensions was because I found that 3D printers were precise only to the thousandth place, but I wish that I had actually done a smaller um, connection joint space gap because I found later in my flute that while these slide in nicely together, it wasn't airtight. So this leads me to two surveys I conducted with Wheeler High School's wind ensemble flautists. And something to keep in mind is I had a really small sampling size. I had only seven people do the survey. And so with the first one, I was looking at lip plate comfortability. And I asked two questions on the survey, the comfort of the lip plate and then also the ease of play. And this was ranked on a score of one to five. And so with this, I had a null hypothesis that students would pick head joint number four because that was what's most like their flute. And then the alternate hypothesis was that students would not pick that head joint. And so I ran a one-way ANOVA test to determine if my data was significant or not. So I got a p-value that was less than 0.1, and I set 0.1 as the alpha value in my case because of my small sampling size. And since it was smaller than 0.1, it was significant, and this is for the lip plate comfortability specific question. And the, when I went back and looked at the data, the reason why it was significant is because all the fluids across the board ranked head joint number four as four out of five. And so that's why the p-value is so low, because the chances of that happening is very, very small. And so this actually still supports my null hypothesis due to that reasoning. And for the second question, the ease of play score, I got that the p-value was insignificant, and so that supports my null hypothesis too. So in conclusion, the flautist picked head joint number four, though I think with more time, I could have found one that matched the physicality better underneath the lip, and that they could have potentially picked that, because head joint three was very close in scores. So embouchure hole shaping. So I decided to do some extremes on this for different shapes because I haven't seen any flutes with a completely round circle before as an embouchure hole, and I found out why I haven't seen that. Um, so head joint number three in this case was the one that was most similar to the head joints that, were, that the students play on. So that was my null hypothesis that students would pick that. The alternate hypothesis was that they wouldn't pick that. And I found that the p-levels for both of the questions um, in this case, which was lower register ease of play and higher register ease of play, were both insignificant, so it supported that the third head joint would be the most comfortable to play. However, the averages of the scores overall for head joint number four were higher, but it just wasn't significant enough to, to, for me to reject my null hypothesis. So now I'm going to go into some, some art data. These are some demographics you should know before I show it to you. Um, notice that we have more of a white population in the sampling size, and that we also have more of a senior population. And so this is my art data, and I actually have it right up here. And on here, I have the different percents of what race chose each head joint with um, the points. And how I calculated this was I did the average of the summation of the two questions, and then I made that into a score out of 10 and put that into inches. So the head joints that were more favorable are longer. And so what's cool is with this, in comparison to the graphs that I had showed you, is that you can also hear it. The lower the frequency is, it will actually be, um, it means that more people picked it, and then also the longer it is, more people picked it. So, continuing on. So, my next um, sub problem was the tuning of the head joints. I wanted to see if my actual head joint, which is a Powell Sonora head joint, was in tune with the four that I used for my lip plate test and the four that I used for my embouchure test. So, what I found was, after conducting these graphs, which I'll explain in a second, was that my head joint was not in tune with any of them because it's significantly longer and that affects frequency and that the four with the lip plates, different lip plates, were in tune with each other but what I didn't expect with this was that the ones with different embouchure holes, that some of them would actually be in tune with each other the two with the largest surface area were in tune with each other and the two with the smallest surface area were in tune with each other and going back to this, how I did this was in Audacity I used the analyze function and so I would play each head joint for five seconds, 15 times and then I had five seconds of rest in between those times. And using the analyze function, I was able to generate these graphs. And what's important about these graphs is the very first peak is going to be the frequency I was playing. 
while each peak after that is simply an overtone. So I just calculated the top of the first peak to easily find out what frequency I was playing on average throughout that entire duration. And so moving on, so this is my final subproblem question. Which iteration is the closest in achieving the range of a concert flute? So this is my first iteration, which I have here with me today. My second iteration had air leak problems because that was after I conducted my um, connection joint subproblem. And I found that, oh man, I needed to actually be a little bit smaller. And then iteration three was airtight. However, there was a problem with my effective length of the flute, so it does not play well either. And iteration four, I incorporated the key mechanism, but there are some air leaks between connection joints because of how the flute is warping due to the connection joints kind of bending, if you can see it. So that's something I want to fix in the future. And so here I put together a simple table with all the notes in an octave, and it turns out my first iteration was the best at playing it, so it was the most successful in achieving this range, which really surprised me because I thought that by iteration four that it would probably be the best, but I was wrong. So errors and limitations. So halfway through my project, I realized that when I was exporting my file from the CAD program, that I could actually change the precision to be more precise. And thus, after that, it doubled my printing time and made it more precise, which changed the dimension slightly of the space in between, which caused me some great grief. Um, then also, 3D printed support structures that were generated by the slicer program often messed up my prints. So I had to go back through, take them out, and reprint, which just added to my time limitations. And then dimensions in CAD, every now I would screw up connection joints were a huge thing with making sure that they were airtight. And then sample size for the survey, I would like to increase in the future. And I'd also like to have people that are not flautist so that they do not have their bias that they had. And then also, I want to fix the head joint because something I didn't take into account was that pitch angle. So I found when I actually attached my head joint to my flutes, that it could play more overtones than my flutes could with the current head joint. So fixing this pitch angle issue, I could fix that. So key fix, if you notice on my last iteration, all of them are at different angles right now. And that's simply because the magnets are the exact same strength, but there's a little bit more tension between some of the parts when they're connected in. And that was not on my part because it's the exact same space. That's a 3D printing um, fluke you could say. And so to fix this, I could add, here I'm going to draw it on the board so it makes a little bit more sense. Because right now how I have the key mechanism in is you have the actual connection joint and there's a little bit of a wall right here and then the key slides into that slot. But if I make that wall a little bit closer and longer in size, then the key won't be able to move up and thus that will restrict the key and make them all go to the same angle, which is something I would want to have in the future. And that's more just an aesthetic thing than a functionality thing. And then also, I found that when playing this, it's a little bit uncomfortable for this hand, having the keys facing this way. So I could simply print it so the key mechanism is on this side and make it more comfortable to play. And then in addition to that, my next survey, as I said, I want a larger sample size with flutists that, um, that aren't flutists because they're biased towards their head joints. And so now I wanted to do a really huge thank you to one, my parents, because they supported me through this. And there was often times where my dad would stay home and just 3D print all day so I could successfully accomplish this. So without him, this project never would have gone as far as it did. I want to thank Dr. Sue. He's the person that I met up with on every Friday at Georgia Tech, and we went over my research. I want to thank Dr. Clark, because he was my mentor, and he, he was the person that gave me all these opportunities. Dr. Maloney and Dr. Berkermeyer, because they've supported me through this entire process and have always told me not to stress myself out too much. And then also Mr. Kent, because I went to him with the help for, of the statistics that I did with the one-way ANOVA tests. And so he's been a great help with that and helping me determine what would be a good alpha value for how small my sampling size was. And without him, I don't know if my data could have been as valuable and valid as it was because the one-way ANOVA tests made my data more va um, valid than if I had just done um, just simple averages. And so I just want to give a huge thank you. And this concludes the very end of my presentation. Okay. <laughs> so that's how it is. Could you play the other one? The 
other one doesn't play that well because of the air leaks. I think I can only get like one note to play, if that. So this one still has improvements to go. Here. I thought the magnets in the design were really cool. Did mm -hmm. you find that to be more like an experimental thing, or did you find that they were actually like better in some way than the traditional spring mechanism? They were definitely better than the traditional spring mechanism because the spring mechanism has more moving parts involved with it. So with this, there's less moving parts, and so there's less um, likely that it will actually fail than the springs. So it's more durable. Yes, Nirja. Okay, so with um, your overall research, was it just like? You decided to do this by yourself, or just like your lab introduced you to this? No, I decided to do this um, by myself because I wasn't collecting any data from my research, um, mm -hmm. from my internship. So my research project was really open-ended, so I decided to pursue something I was interested in. But I still contributed to the overall department because I was adding research in a field that they hadn't really explored with yet. Okay. Yes, Joshua? Are those keys held in by metal things? Yes, that's where the screws came in. I forgot to mention that. Thank you. Um, so. What's cool about this is also each tone hole is its own little connection joint. So if something does break, I can easily fix it. And so in here, there's these little slots. And so I slid the key in, and then I was able to use screws for like glasses and keep them in place. And so it's, it's never coming apart. <laughs> yes, Sarah? Um, what did you use to model the lips when you were doing the auto shirt? That's something I want to look to in the future. Because with me, I just kind of estimated it to have um, extremes of like what could be possible, but I do want to conduct another survey where I have more specific and go to the physicality more of with the um, lip plates and have one that's between my third and fourth um, head joint because that w those were the two that were most like and I think something between that would have been the perfect match. Yes, Leah. So was your first iteration the one without the spacing? Is that why there were air leaks in it? Please. Yes, so actually that, this one was the one that had to be sanded a ridiculous amount in order for it to fit. So there are no air leaks. Um, I fixed that in the third iteration, so that one didn't have air leaks either, because I found that it's better to print it just a smidgen bigger so that you do sand it and it avoids air leaks. And so the third iteration, the reason it doesn't play is because there's an issue with the effective length overall of the instrument, and so that was um, a air calculation error on my part. Joshua. Do you think the creation of something as specific as like a musical instrument, like flute, do you think um, in the future additive manufacturing with 3D printing could be better for that, or do you think um, humans are going to keep you know, crafting it? Um, there's been a lot of things with tone quality, like as I brought up the 1950s controversy with the gold flute sounding better. So people in general are going to lean towards the metal instruments because they have a perception that they're going to sound better, but that's not necessarily the case. And what's really neat with 3D printing is that with like the lip plate, you can do a very unique design that you can't have otherwise. And so it's kind of hard because getting away from that perception bias that the population has, that I, I don't know if that's possible, to be quite frank. So it's an interesting idea, though. Yes. Yeah, you um, Sorry. Do you think in the future you can see this field going to a place where you can customize a flute for every single person? Oh, definitely. Because I'm sure there will be some sort of scanner mechanism where you can actually scan the physicality of the underneath of the lip and then actually create a lip plate to match that. And then as far as like hands go, something neat about this that I didn't mention during my presentation is because each of these tone holes are a different joint, you can slide them either which way you want. So if your hand placement is a little bit different from a different person and you have like longer fingers, it's more comfortable for this tone hole to be at a different angle, you can change that on this flute. Yes, Leo. Do you think there's a possibility that in the future a plastic flute could be used over a metal flute in marching bands to make it less cold on your face? Or do you think the sound quality and do you think there's just um, less possibility for that in the future? I definitely think that's definitely a possibility because what's cool about this, if something breaks on it, you can easily 3D print it again, especially with this model because if it's just one joint, you just have to 3D print that joint so it's not even that big of a time consumption. And it's also overall cheaper to 3D print than actually buy a new flute. And then on top of that, as you're talking about with um, the coldness and it being easier to play, so obviously metal's more conductive, so that would make the instrument colder, so people would probably pick the 3D printed flute over it, even if the tone quality was less, um, as, good, less as good as the metal flute. And there's no proof showing that their plastic flutes sound not as good as the metal flutes, because it's just a vibration of the air column that's producing the tone, so the, um, tone, so the actual material should not impact the tone quality. 
Tori, thank you very much. Okay.